please help me welcome Craig O'Rourke. Thank you, Paul. Everybody hear me okay? Great. So um, I've written a book, Destination Perpetuity. The premise of my book is to introduce the reader to what I believe to be true wealth. So I want to start by talking today about what wealth is. Now, there's thousands of people that work here at Google. And if I had the opportunity to ask every person what wealth is, I'd get hundreds if not thousands of different answers. But when I ask people what wealth is, I notice most people usually give me a number. They'll say, well, I'd feel wealthy if I had a half a million dollars or a million dollars or $10 million. My point is, most people think of wealth in finite terms. I don't think of wealth that way. I don't think of wealth in a finite term because if you have a million dollars or $10 million, and if you live long enough and well enough, you won't have any money left, right? You'll go through it. I think of wealth as infinite. Wealth to me is safe, secure, dependable cash flow. It's money you can count on month after month, year after year, and decade after decade. That's why I think investing in income-producing real estate is by far the best investment anybody can make to create true wealth. Why do I say that? Because income-producing real estate, the nature of it is a self-funding investment, which makes it also a self-sustaining investment, thereby creating an investment that is an annuity for life. It's a stream of cash that lasts forever, isn't it? It's truly an infinite amount of money. So let me explain what I mean by that. But before I get into that, I'm going to tell you how I got the idea for the book. I was asked recently, how would you think of putting this book together? Well, it came to me organically. I'm a baby boomer, 57 years old. And I noticed when I was in my 20s, 30s, and 40s, conversations with friends and coworkers were very carefree things. We'd talk about where the best happy hour was, going play beach volleyball or rock climbing. About the time I turned 50, those conversations started to change. Started talking about knee replacements, Lipitor, and Social Security solvency. Now, out of all of these AARP-related topics, the one that seemed to cause the most anxiety among people was the one you'd think they'd get the most excited about, the topic of retirement. When I'd ask people how or when they wanted to retire, I'd get shrugs. People would say, I'm going to work till I die. I had one friend, when I asked her when she was going to retire, she simply started crying. <laughs> I thought, this is not good. And I knew a better way. I know a way to build true wealth. So I decided to share it by writing this book. Now, I've been fortunate. My book has been selling pretty well and started trending a little bit. And so I've gotten speaking engagements. And I was recently up in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I was speaking to a group of real estate investors. And at the end, had a question and answer period. And this one woman stood up and she said, I really enjoyed your, your talk. And I'm going to buy your book. And I might even try and follow some of your, uh, your ideas. She said, but there was one thing missing in your presentation. And I said, what was that? And she said, you didn't mention anything about your qualifications. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, where did you go to school? What degrees in finance do you have? And I said, well, I, I don't have any degrees in finance. I've never studied finance. And she said, well, with all due respect, why should we listen to you about investing money if you don't have any qualifications? So I shared a story with her. I told her that I've had a front row seat for almost 40 years, watching as a real estate portfolio started with just a conversation around my parents' kitchen table and blossomed into a self-funding, self-sustaining portfolio of income-producing real estate that carried my parents through their retirement very comfortably. Let me tell you how that came to be. My dad was a real estate broker. I was the youngest of four boys. And he was fairly successful. He sold income-producing real estate. And he was so successful, he decided to open his own brokerage about the time I was eight or nine years old. Now, that caused a lot of anxiety in my house because when you start a business, it's expensive. So any extra money that was coming into the house went right back in to build the business. So consequently, there wasn't a lot of money in our house on a monthly basis. And there certainly wasn't a lot of uh, savings in our house either. Now, my mother was most bothered by this. She would sit once a month at the kitchen table and pay all the bills. And about halfway through paying the bills, she'd always say the same thing, which puzzled me. She'd say, I'm tired of this roller coaster. Get me off this ride. Of course, that was her analogy for the fact that my parents never quite seemed to have enough money, right? I didn't understand that analogy. 
about my dad's business and the income we had. But even at that early age of eight or nine, I too had a gauge on my dad's business. My gauge was a dinner table. You see, I knew if we had spaghetti too many nights in a row, my dad didn't have any clients. If we had spaghetti with meat sauce, I figured he got a listing. If there was chicken on the table, something was in escrow. And if I came home and felt, smelled steak, ah, contingencies have been removed, right? <laughs> now, it didn't matter to me. I like chicken, steak, and pasta all the same, but it mattered to my mom. It mattered a great deal to my mom. So I'll never forget the night that this conversation of retirement came. My mom was cooking dinner, stirring yet another pot of spaghetti. I was sitting there doing my homework. My dad came walking in. And my mother, when my dad opened the door and walked in, my mother froze him in the doorway with just a stare. He knew something was up. He just froze. He said, what? What did I do? My mom said, out completely out of the blue, what are you doing about our financial future? My dad was ill prepared for this question. He said, I, I work every day. My mom said, I, I, so do I. I got four kids. <laughs> I work every day, too. That wasn't the question. She said, the question was, what are you doing about our financial future, our retirement? My dad thought about it for a minute. He was a real estate agent, so he always had an answer, right? Finally said, I'm going to work till I die. My mom said, OK, that's fine. You go ahead and do that. You go ahead and work till you die. But what if you die first? What about me, and what about these kids? Well, my dad agreed that that was not a very good plan. So that night, after dinner, they sat at the kitchen table, and they talked about options. Now, the, the obvious option right, would be for them to buy a piece of income-producing real estate. After all, my dad was a real estate broker. He sold income-producing real estate. He owned a, re a real estate brokerage. But the problem was he didn't have enough money. They had a very small amount of money saved, not enough to buy a piece of real estate, because real estate's expensive. So they went to plan B they decided to talk to my dad's friend, Don. Now, Don and my dad had been lifelong friends. They had gone to college together. They had served in the military together. They'd raised their family together. We used to vacation with them. We were so close that my brothers and I called him Uncle Don. And the one thing I remember most about Don was everybody always said, he's the smartest guy we know. That was everybody said about Don. So when my, I heard my parents, I didn't know what retirement was, but when I heard they were going to talk to Uncle Don about it, I knew this was causing anxiety in the house. I thought, problem solved. They're going to talk to Don. So a couple weeks went by. My parents had that appointment with Don. I was very excited to find out what Don had to say. So after the appointment, I came running up to my dad. I said, Dad, 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 what did Don say? What did Don say about our retirement? My dad just shook his head. He said, son, we're not going with Don. I said, what do you mean? He's the smartest guy we know. We have to go with Don. My dad could tell I was a little anxious. He said, son, this is not for you to worry about. He said, just know this. Don wants to invest our money in the stock market, and we don't like that idea. Now, my parents had both been children of the Depression, so they knew firsthand how devastating so much money in the stock market can be, and they were going to take that risk. So I said, well, what are you going to do, Dad? He said, don't worry about it, son. I'm going to invest our money. Now, again, I knew my dad was good at his job. I knew he invested money for other people, so that was fine. I went about my business. But my dad had a problem, didn't he? My dad did not have enough money for a piece of income-producing real estate. So he took a page from my mom's playbook. He went to work the next day, and he asked all of his friends and his coworkers how and when they got, were planning on retiring. Some of them shrugged. Some of them cried. <laughs> some of them said they'd work till they die. My dad found a few like-minded friends, and together they pooled their money, they formed a partnership, and they bought their first piece of income-producing real estate. And a few years later, they bought another one. And a few years later, they bought another one. And in a relatively short amount of time, chicken and steak became much more frequent on our dinner table. Our summer vacations camping in Big Bear became two weeks in the Hawaiian Islands. The plan was working. The cash was flowing. And in a, after a few years, they were successful. They had a portfolio of cash positive properties generating income and building equity over time. When they got to their desired retirement age, they were set. They retired. They had a very comfortable retirement. They had 20 years of worry-free retirement. They lived in a beautiful home, drove nice cars. They traveled. They had the good life for 20 years. Safe, secure, dependable money they could count on for 20 years. Everything was good. But life changes, doesn't it? And in 1997, my dad's good friend, Don, passed away. 
This was a very sad thing for my dad. They were very close. My parents were very upset. So I decided to take them to the service. Driving home from the service, I said to my dad, I said, you know, dad, you know what I remember most about Uncle Don? He said, what? I said, everybody always used to say he was the smartest guy we knew. And my dad laughed. He goes, they, they, people did say that, son. I remember that. And he said, but you know what? When it came to investing, your mother and I were smarter. And I, and I said, oh, I remember that, dad. I remember you didn't invest with Don because he was going to put your money in the stock market. My dad said, that was only part of it. That was only part of the story. He said, you were too young for me to explain to you what the real reason we didn't invest. And I said, what was it? See, what my parents didn't like was the fact that Don's firm used actuaries. Now, most of you probably here know what an actuary does when they work for an insurance firm like that. What they do is they ask you certain questions. They say, uh, do you drink? Do you smoke? Do you use recreational drugs? Do you exercise? Is there cancer or diabetes or any other ticking time bomb in your family bloodline? They take all this information and they compare it to mortality charts because they need to determine approximately how long you're going to live. They need to know that information because they need to give that to men and women like Don who plan for your finances because they need to figure out approximately how long your money needs to last. My parents didn't like that. My parents didn't like the idea of being told how long their money would last and how long they were going to live. So they went a different route, didn't they? They invested in real estate and worked out beautifully for them. But why? Why is real estate a better investment? Let's do a little side-by-side -side comparison. Now remember, I don't have any degrees in finance, but this is just my view of how any investment works. I see all investments as having four phases. Okay? The first phase is the initial investment. You simply pick what you're going to invest in, and you create a plan, don't you? So if you, uh, it's certainly easier to get in the stock market. You can start with a little bit of money. You go to somebody like Don, and you say, hey, I want to invest in the stock market. And you decide your level of risk tolerance and all these good things. You lay out your plan. I want to retire at this age, and I want to have this much money. Great. Similar in some ways to real estate. With real estate, you, you still have to devise a plan. right? You have to figure out when you're, the building is going to get paid off or paid down to a point where it can generate enough cash flow for you to retire off of. But the harder part with real estate is that down payment, isn't it? It takes a lot of money to get into real estate. So a lot of people shy away from real estate because of phase one, because it takes a lot of money, right? So phase one is absolutely easier to get into in, uh, with the stock market than real estate. But what about the other phases? Let's take a look at phase two for a minute. Phase two is the continued funding phase. This is a very important phase. Right? No matter what you invest in, you're probably going to have to continually fund it. I mean, most people start with a small amount of money and a very aggressive retirement plan. Everyone wants to retire as early as possible and as wealthy as possible, don't we? So if you go to a guy like Don, you say, hey, here, here's, my, here's my money. Let's, let's get going. Don's going to say, thank you very much. Glad you entrusted me with your money. Um, and I'm going to do everything I can to, to build your portfolio. But I got to tell you, you gave me a small amount of money here and an aggressive plan. So you're going to have to help out. So Mr. and Mrs. Investor, every month, you're going to write, write me a check. Month after month, year after year, decade after decade, the investor is writing checks to fund their own portfolio. Don does his part. The investor does their part. And the, it works nicely. That's called investor funding. What about real estate? Real estate also needs to be funded, doesn't it? You have a mortgage. You have taxes. You have insurance. You have a property manager. And you better put some money away because that roof will leak and that carpet will need to be changed. So you better have a rainy day fund. It takes a lot of money, doesn't it? So that's, that's real estate investing. But here's the part I like about real estate best. Those dollars should be coming not from you, but from your tenants. Month after month, year after year, decade after decade, those in, those, that investor funding should all come from your tenants' pockets, not yours. What about, what about the fun part? What about phase three, distribution? That's the really good part. All right, fast forward, you're 65 or whatever age you decide to retire at. Ring, 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 Get, pick up the phone, it's Don. He says, happy birthday, happy 65th birthday. We made it, you're fully funded. Don't send me any more checks. I'm going to send you checks, and he does. He starts sending you checks month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Those dollars are flowing into you, right? Same with real estate. You've, you've made a plan, and your, your property's been paid down or paid off to the point where all of those tenant dollars are now funding your investment, right? They both work pretty much the same in phase three, just the distribution phase. But phase four is the most important. Phase four is the continued asset growth. You see, with Don's plan, what happens? The asset itself, the stocks, the bonds, the mutual funds, whatever you've invested in, must be sold off. It must 
be liquidated every time you're going to get some type of disbursement. So over time, that portfolio liquidates until there's nothing left. But that's not the case with real estate. You see, because real estate is self-funding, the self-funding nature of real estate creates a self-sustaining investment, right? Which provides distributions from the excess cash flow. And the real estate itself is left untouched to be able to continually appreciate in value over time. You see, my parents didn't like the idea of fixed parameters of time and money. What they wanted was infinite cash flow. And that's what they got. They created an annuity for life. They had a stream of cash that would last forever. That's what income producing real estate can do for you if you do it right. And it's a really good thing they went that path. Because remember those actuaries? They told my dad he'd live to be 75. He didn't listen. My dad lived to be 83 years old. Eight years past what the actuaries had planned for. He would have run out of money at 75 years old, but instead, those eight years, he wasn't stressed about money or looking for a job. My dad was living a very comfortable life, living in a beautiful home, traveling, enjoying life. And my mom? They told my mom she lived to 78. She also did not listen. My mother lived to 98. 20 years beyond what the actuaries would have planned for. 20 years. She would have run out of money in 1997 at 78 years old. You know what would have happened? She would have ended up on my pull-out sofa in my guest room. But that's not what happened. What happened instead was she continued to live her life. She lived in a beautiful home. She drove a nice car. She traveled. She ate out. She lived the good life. My mother never even thought twice about spending every dime in her checking account, even as a widower in her 90s, because she knew Next, money, there'd be, next month, there'd be more money. She knew that because she had almost 40 years of watching a cash flow portfolio provide money month after month, year after year, decade after decade for nearly 40 years. She never worried about money. And what happened to her real estate portfolio from 1997, when she would have had run out of money with Dawn, to the year 2017 that she lived to, it exploded, didn't it? I'll tell anybody here what happened to Southern California income producing real estate from 1997 to 2017. It exploded. The biggest change in my mom's financial world was she was worth so much more money, right? She wasn't broke. Everything continued to grow, and she continued to have all the money she needed to live off of. Now, before my dad died, my mom was much healthier than him, and he knew she was going to live for a long time. And so he came to me and he said, you know, son, I want to make sure you take care of your mom's portfolio. And I said, I, I will, Dad, I promise. So after, uh, after my dad passed, I went to my mom. I said, Mom, I, I got to tell you, I, I made this promise to Dad. My mom said, oh, don't worry about it. She said, I got a good CPA. I'll get a good accountant. I'll take care of everything. You got your own life. You're too busy. Don't worry about it. I said, no, I made Dad that promise, and I'm going to take care of everything. So she said, OK, but before you, before you sign on to this, let me tell you what you're getting yourself into. I said, OK. She said, I've got four properties. I said, I know that. She said, all four of those checks come in at different times of the month. I said, OK. She goes, I want them deposited the minute they come in. I said, no problem. I'll set it up on automatic deposit. She said, oh, no, not my money. No, you're going to take it to, you're gonna take it to the bank and deposit it at my branch. And I said, well, mom, I don't mind depositing it. But there's a branch right by my house. She said, oh, no, 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 no. You'll go to my branch, and you'll go to window six, and you'll see Maria. <laughs> I said, mom. I, 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 OK, fine, I'll go to your branch, but there's an ATM I'm just going to use. And she goes, oh, no, 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 no. I had a problem with an ATM in eight, 1983. That's not happening. <laughs> you're going to my branch. You're going to talk to Maria. I said, Mom, your branch has incredibly long lines. She goes, I know. You should take a newspaper and a cup of coffee. I said, all right, but what if I get there and Maria's not there? She said, then you'll go back the next day. So guess what I did for four times a month? I'd go to the bank. And I got in the habit of taking a newspaper and taking a cup of coffee because they were the longest lines I'd ever seen. And this one particular day, I, was, I always take the USA Today. And you're probably all familiar with the format. And they have the money section. It's in green. And they have a little money snapshot at the base, right? This one particular day had a very interesting little money snapshot. And it was the results of a, a poll they'd done by money managers, people like Don, men and women like Don, 
that invest money for people. And the poll asks one simple question. What drives your clients? Is it greed or is it fear? By an overwhelming 83%, the respondents answered fear. It was fear that drove people to invest. And that's, that's really smart, because it is fearful to run out of money, isn't it? And as I was standing this line, I looked around the bank, and they had a series of posters all encouraging people to invest money with this bank. And they were all based in fear. And I thought, wow, this bank's really ahead of the curve, right? I'm reading USA Today now, and they've already got it up, they've got these posters up. And there was one poster in particular that really struck me. And it was this nice little couple, they're probably 65, 70 years old, sitting on a park bench, having a little picnic. And the caption reads, will you outlive your money? And I thought, wow, it's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? And down below it says, contact us to find the answers. And as I'm standing in this line, I'm holding a check for $6,000 in my hand. And that check represented the proceeds from one of my mom's properties. And that, those proceeds, those were after the taxes were paid, and after the insurance was paid, and after the property was paid. That's what she brought back from that one property every, every month, right? $6,000. I wanted to stand up and yell, I got the answer right here. This is the answer, right? Income producing real estate. But I, as I was holding that check, I started thinking, you know, how did this check come to be? And I remember exactly when my dad bought that building. I remember because it was the same week I got my driver's license. It was 1976, I was 16 years old, my, and I was running around, I got my driver's license, so excited. My dad was running around, I bought a building, you know. And he would always tell the story about this building, he was very proud of it. And uh, the story he would tell is, it was a listing of his, right? And it was 1976, the economy was not great, um, interest rates were rather high, and this building in this particular area was really not a very good area. People were steering away from it, so they weren't really investing money into it. But my dad really believed in this building, and so he was, uh, he'd advertised it, and he got the owner to do some work on it. And back then, of course, 1976, nobody had computers, so in order, what real estate agents had to do, they had to pick up the phone, and they had to start calling people. So my dad would call everybody he knew, and you know, all, the, all the clients he knew, all the agents he knew. He did this for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, just no takers. So he went back to the seller, a guy named Bill. And he said, Bill, I, I got to tell you, I've tried everything. I've advertised. I've called. There's, just, there's no takers. And Bill said, I got to sell this building. And my dad said, I know. I think you need to reduce the price. And Bill said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to reduce the price. You told me it was worth $110,000. My dad said, well, I believe that, but I can't convince anybody else of that. And he said, well, I'm not reducing the price. Think of something else. So my dad thought about it. And he said, well, you know, interest rates are kind of high right now. And uh, lending, uh, there's, lending's pretty restrictive right now. He said, uh, you own the building free and clear. Bill said, that's right. He said, would you consider doing uh, some, some uh, owner finance? He said, absolutely. He said, would you be really aggressive with it and, and let somebody put 10% down? Bill said, absolutely, but I want my price. So my dad said, okay. So he got back that day to the office, got back on the phone, started calling people, called his one friend, Jim. Now, he'd sell lots of real estate to Jim. And, he made Jim a lot of money. And he called Jim and, and said, Jim, Jim, i got to tell you about this building. Jim said, Mike, you've called me about that building five times. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want it. I don't like that area. He said, no, you've got to listen to me. And he told him about the financing. And he said, well, it does sound like a good deal. But Jim said, you know, Mike, i got to ask you a question. If this building's such a good deal, why don't you buy it? And my dad said, I would love to buy it, Jim, but I don't have any money. And he said, OK. You have a commission, don't you? Dad said, yes. He said, what's your commission? He said, 5%. He said, OK. And what does he want down in the building? 10%. Jim said, OK, tell you what, let's buy it together. I'll put in 5%, you roll your commission in. So they did. They bought that building. They bought that building in 1976 for $110,000. They put $11,000 down, $5,500 each. My dad, that was my dad's commission he rolled in. And as I'm standing in this line, holding this check for $6,000, I started thinking, wow, what is the return on investment, the ROI, on a $5,500 investment that returns $6,000? What's well, over 100%, isn't it? But you know, I thought about it. I thought, well, that's not really the right way to figure a return on investment, is it? Because in real estate, we always talk in annualized numbers, don't we? So if you want to look at it as an annualized number, it's really $72,000 a year. I thought, wow, that's amazing, a $5,500 investment that returns $72,000 a year. So I was starting to figure out the ROI, and I thought, wait, that's not right either. That's not the right way to figure it either. Because you really have to look at all the positive cash flow. And the building's been paid off for 20 years. Now, I've been doing the books that long, so I happen to know it hasn't been $6,000 a month. But on average, it was $4,000 a month. 
So if you look at $4,000 a month times 12 months, well, that's $48,000 a year, right? Multiply that by 20, you have $960,000, don't you? So a $5,500 investment that returns $960,000 of positive cash flow. So I started to figure the ROI on that. And I thought, wait, 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 that's not right either. Because we also have to consider the first 20 years. Because remember, this is a self-funding, self-sustaining investment. And those tenant dollars, remember that phase two where the tenant dollars come in to pay down? You've got to figure that, too. Those were dollars that came in to pay this off. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't $4,000 a month back then. But you know what it was? It was $2,000. So if you look at that, $2,000 a month times 240 months, well, that's $480,000. You add that to the $960,000, you come up with $1,440,000. I thought, OK, a $5,500 investment that returns $1,440,000. What is the ROI on that? And I started to figure that out. And I said, wait a second. It's not right either. Because we're only talking about the cash flow here, aren't we? You see, real estate has multiple streams of income. You know, there's also tax advantages. There's 1031s, there's write-offs, there's depreciations. My head wants to explode when I start to think about that stuff. I leave that for the CPA. But let's talk about the big dog. What about appreciation? That's where people really make money in real estate. It's appreciation, isn't it? So this building that my parents paid $110,000 for is currently valued at $2.7 million. All right, but remember, they had a partner with this, didn't they? So their value of the building would be $1,350,000. Now, if you add that $1,350,000 to the $1,440,000 of cash that came in over those years, you get $2,790,000 on a $5,500 investment. So OK, I started thinking, now I have all the numbers to figure out what the ROI is. And just as I was starting to calculate that, I thought, that's not right either. You know why? Because next month, there's another check. And the month after that, <laughs> it goes on and on, doesn't it? So what is the ROI on a $5,500 investment that generates $2.7 million and counting? I'll tell you what it is. It's financial freedom. It is true wealth. That's what the return on investment is. It's true wealth. And what is true wealth? True wealth is financial peace of mind. It's safe, secure, dependable cash flow. It's money you can count on month after month, year after year, decade after decade. That, to me, is true wealth. Let me give you a statistic. I thought this was kind of interesting. 60% of Americans feel somewhat confident about having enough money to retire. But only 18% feel truly confident they have enough money. My parents were part of that 18%. My family's part of that 18%. My clients were all part of that 18%. Everybody here should be part of that 18%. You should have that confidence that you have enough money to retire. Life is full of choices, isn't it? And where you decide to invest your money is a choice, isn't it? So to me, the idea of investing in a self-funding, self-sustaining investment that continues to grow even during distributions as compared to a continually diminishing portfolio, well, there's, there's no question at all. I mean, the answer is as simple as, well, this, right? Pretty easy answer. <laughs> I title my book Destination Perpetuity because the word perpetuity means an annuity that has no end or a stream of cash that lasts forever. That is what real estate investing can and should be. Thank you very much for your time. If you have some questions, I'll be here for a few minutes. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, let me throw the uh, mic back to you. This is a, holy cow, that's awesome. Never seen the Google mic. Google has the bro. coolest stuff. <laughs> this is comfortable to hold, too. All right. Um, quick question, going back to the numbers you were presenting. Yes. That was really interesting, but I, did, I struggled to follow where the, uh, it, the mortgage payment and taxes and insurance and capital expenditures and all that yeah. was accounted for. Sure. So the first 20 years, right, all of that, the, the tenant dollars, the tenant funding dollars go when they pay off all that. The was the 4000 your net, uh, net operating, in, it was your cash flow? The, the, the 6000 and 4000 yeah, so 6000 that check I was holding in that bank line, 
That's, that's in the pocket, that's, that's your net, yes. That's after everything's been paid. So after, the mortgage is already gone at that point, but that's after the taxes, the insurance, the property manager, after money's put away in a rainy day fund. That is, those are your net in the pocket pre-tax dollars, yes. So your numbers started after that 90% debt. It was 90% leveraged, right? 5% down from your debt. It was not, so the first 20 years, the building was paid off. Okay. Yeah. And, and your numbers and so, aren't correlating to that time frame. Oh, they didn't? I have to go back and look. Oh, no, I'm wondering. It, I'm, I was confirming. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the first, I know everybody could, that, so those slides, I got to clean them up. They always confuse people. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, and it goes too fast, too. It's those, so the first 20 years, the building gets paid off, got paid off. And that's really a good, that's a good rule of thumb for anybody investing in real estate. You should really try and create a plan that pays your building off in 20 years. I'm looking at some very young people here. You pay your building off in 20 years. When you're my age, you have that cash flow building. That's, that's sort of the idea of it. And then the next 20 years, you still have, you still have you know, taxes and insurance and all of that. But you know, because of the magic of inflation, right? And uh, you, those, those dollars are always big enough to, to then sustain uh, ec extra cash flow Got for it. the investor. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? I'll see at the end. Hello. Hi. Um, so obviously California is super expensive. If you want to buy anywhere in LA, it's basically a million dollars, which is a couple hundred thousand down for down payment. So even if you split it with a couple people, it's expensive. What are your thoughts on buying an investment property in another state, even if you're not there to kind of manage it? It's a great question. So keep this in mind. That same argument you have right there was 40, people were having 40 years ago, and they'll be having 40 years from now. Um, so you can buy in other states, you can buy in other parts of LA or other parts of Southern California. Risk equals reward. And I, when I work with clients and they, uh, they want to buy income producing property, I always ask them the same thing. I always say, what do you want? Do you want cash flow or do you want to grow equity? What do you think they always say? Both. That's what everybody wants, right? But you, you, do have to, you do have to make choices. In other words, we're in Venice right now. So if we go to buy a, uh, an income producing property in Venice, our cap rate's probably gonna be about maybe two or 3%, right? It's really bad. It's gonna take you forever to cash flow on a property like that. But what was our appreciation rate in Venice last year? It's like 8%. It's crazy, right? So now if we take those same dollars, and I'll give you a perfect example. I have a client that I sold his property in Redondo Beach, and he wanted to reinvest in Southern California, and the cap rates were, were not good. They were like five or six. And he said, you know, Craig, I'm going to take my money and move it to Ohio. I can get a t nine cap, 10 cap. That's basically your rate of return on the money, right? And I said, OK. I said, but he was young. He was 38, 39 years old. I said, but are you sure you want to do that? He said, why? He, I said, I own business. I have owned buildings there for years, and they cash flow great. And I said, how do they appreciate it? He said, they don't. That's where you make your money. So you have to create a plan. You have to say, what do I really want out of this? Do I, do I want, so looking in these, if everybody here came to me and said, I want to invest some dollars, I'd say appreciation dollars first and then cash flow dollars. So we have this beautiful thing called the 1031 tax exchange. So what I do with clients when they come to me early on in their 20s or 30s like that, even, even in your 40s, I encourage you, uh, my idea of a good plan would be to invest someplace that's appreciating. Don't worry about the cash flow yet. Let it appreciate. Get those, get those appreciation dollars, because that's where you make your real money in real estate. Then when you have those appreciation dollars, you do a 1031 tax exchange, which means the IRS allows you to not sell that building, but trade that building for another property. So in other words, your taxes are deferred. There's no tax dollars coming out of your pocket until you would ever sell it. You take all of that equity and you move it into another property that has uh, that has better cap rate. I, I did that with some clients just a few years ago. Uh, I started working with them almost 20 years ago, and we built this beautiful cash flow, uh, this beautiful appreciation portfolio in the South Bay, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, and they bought all these properties, and for 20 years, they just let them grow in appreciation. Didn't really have any money coming in that they could put in their pocket. The, the tenants funded all the bills, but then, when they were ready to retire in their late 40s, we sold everything, we moved everything down to Long Beach, and their cap rate tripled, and suddenly they had six figures a year to retire off of. So you have to plan it out. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah. Good shot. Wow. <laughs> not a very good catch, though. Um, do you think there's any value to flipping houses, buying houses that are not good, or buying empty land and then developing them? Yeah. Well, there's, there's, two, separate, there's two different questions. One's, one's a developing question, and one's developing, and one's flipping. Um, this is a tough market for flipping. You're about eight years too late. But 
We cycle through those markets all the time. And there are deals out there. I just worked with a developer recently. A year ago, I found him a property that he could flip. And um, we are, we're just working with counteroffers right now. And, but he's a very shrewd developer. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's got a crew. And he's going to make a couple hundred thousand dollars off it. But those, those deals are very hard to find at the moment. But we do cycle through those deals. Developing is, is different also. Developers have to look at properties. Um, they have to put on their own developer glasses and look two to three years out, depending on what you're, what you're selling and what you're trying to build. And then you have to guess, guess what the market will be like when you go to sell it. What will interest rates be like? What will our economy be like? You know, so again, seven, eight years ago, it was easier to see this, this steamroller. Now, I personally think that, um, that we're in a very good economy right now. I, I personally think our economy is going to, uh, is on a, uh, I, I think we're, we're going to do nothing but grow right now. But with that growth comes higher interest rates too, right? So it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? So anybody thinking about buying, do it today because you're never going to see these interest rates again. So even if you think prices are too high, don't worry about it because when you buy real estate, whether it's income producing real estate or real estate you live in, what you have to realize is you're not buying real estate, you're buying a payment, okay? And you, when you buy a payment attached to interest rates like today, it doesn't matter if the real estate goes like this. As long as you're buying it with a 10-year plan, you'll be fine. So don't ever buy real estate with short-term plans like flipping because that's how you can get burned. I, you know, the safer way to buy real estate, I'm very, I'm very conservative. The safest way to buy real estate, I don't buy anything. My, my theory is never sell anything, by the way. Um, but, never, but that doesn't mean you can't trade it, do a 1031 or something like that. And I never buy anything with less than a 10-year plan, okay. personally. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh. Um, what do you think about, for people that, don't, that currently rent, should you be prioritizing um, buying a place to live in or should the investment idea kind of be parallel to where you're living? Because it's, like, it's hard to like, save for a down payment to live and yeah. to do this investment. That's a good question. That's a lifestyle question. It's also a tax question. Um, I, would, uh, I would probably say to you, buy a place to live in if you like where you're going to be. If you know you're going to be here at Google for a while and you're, you're stable in your job and you're stable in your community, buy a place to live because the, the tax write-offs uh, for your personal residence are going to outweigh the tax write-offs for an investment property. And what you can do when you go to sell that property, or better yet, trade that property, you can then move that equity into an income producing property if you want. So you can do that. But in Venice and other areas of LA right now, the average renter, um, if you had 20, have 20% 20 down, you can buy and own for less than you can rent when you figure all your tax savings, your deductions. So if you're renting right now and you can afford to buy, buy it, because these interest rates, we'll never see them again. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so maybe you've already, so I have two questions. Sure. Uh, one, the first one is simpler maybe. Uh, why don't you, um, in terms of your credentials, why don't you just brag about your own portfolio and how this has helped you? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, I. Um, you know, it's, I, I will, I'll, t I'll, I'll brag about that. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll t <laughs> and I'll also tell you what I did wrong. Um, so here's my story. I started investing when I was in my early 20s. And by the time I got to my 44 or so, I was retired, I was done. I had all the positive cash flow I needed to retire. And then I started seeing these, these investments that looked really good. A little bit too good, maybe. And one by one, I started selling properties off and investing in these other investments. It turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. I lost almost everything. And by the time I was 50, I had to start over. 58 next month, right back where I needed to be. It took, I had great focus and I, it was my career, so it was not hard for me to do. I did have a little bit of real estate uh, that I was able to play with and move things around and I knew how to watch the market and see where to go, but I've done it twice. It works. Thank you. And then the second question is, um, is your advice to people, and maybe you already answered this, so forgive me, but is your advice to people who don't have that much cash uh, to partner with other people? Is, or? Yeah, I talk about that in my book. Partnerships are, uh, I talk about double-edged swords again, they're, they're good and they're bad. You have to really be careful who you partner with. And even if it's your, your best friend or your, your, a sibling or whatever, get everything in writing and most importantly, get a good exit strategy in writing. Because invariably, if you two guys partner on something, one of you is going to want out before the other one and it's going to be a problem. So you have to create exit strategies, you have to do all that. But it is, it's one of the best ways to own real estate. And I've owned 
I don't even know how many pieces of property. And I've owned dozens and dozens of properties in partnerships. And I just, you have to be careful who you partner with, and you have to be very clear on who's doing what and, and how you're getting out. <laughs> and then partnerships are fine. Yeah. Yes. Um, like about management companies, I've heard stories, good stories and bad stories. Like, you know, oh, they take all away all your headache, and then some of like, oh my God, it's, you know, if I've done it myself, it would have been better, save me way more money. Yeah. Any, you know. Yeah, it's management. Because uh, yeah. if you have so many properties, you're going to have management for sure. I know. <laughs> Do I it know. yourself. So uh, my family, we have, we have seven properties, my, my family and I. And um, we have uh, some we manage ourselves, some we have uh, property managers for. It's like anything else. It's hard to find good property managers. So you know, when you go to, um, I would almost, if you're going to invest in income producing real estate, I'd almost find a good property manager first. And what the best way to do that is talk to people that you know that own income producing real estate. Ask them who they use. Get references. Get referrals. You know, go online. Check everybody out. Um, there's some really good people out there, and you shouldn't have to pay more than about five or six percent for a really good property manager. And I will tell you this, if you get a good property manager, they'll actually make you more money. Because what they do is they're going to keep your units filled, they're going to keep them filled at market rent. If there's a problem, they're going to take care of it, not you. So property management's the way to go, but you have to be very careful who you choose as your property manager. Yes. i um, curious to hear how the new tax laws are affecting 1031 exchanges and write-offs. Yeah, well, there's, uh, there's no effect with 1031s, but write-offs, depreciation's a big deal. That's a big, big deal. So what's happening, it's, it's your primary residence is now capped at $800,000, right? So th that's, that's going to be an, it's going to be a game changer for, for real estate. Now, I live in Redondo Beach, so um, our, our neighboring community is Manhattan Beach, and the joke there is everybody lives in a McMansion, right? They're these giant houses, 3,500, 4,000 square feet with, you know, the yard's about as big as this stage, you know, and, and, and everybody moved in there 25 years ago, and they were really popular, and everybody paid like a million or two million for them. Well, now they're worth about two and a half million in today's market, right? But my crystal ball says people aren't going to want those because, first of all, they're, they're all filled with empty nesters. They don't want to go up and down those stairs you know, anymore, and the house is too big. They're going to try and sell them, and guess what? If I'm going to buy a house, I'm not going to buy a $2.5 million giant box that I can only write off maybe a third of my interest. So that portion of the market is really going to be impacted. Now, I would say that the 1.4 and less market, good luck finding something like that anywhere around here, but that market's going to be very solid. So. Our, 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 the real estate community is going to change. And as all of that's going on with these new tax laws, mark my words, interest rates are going up this year big time. So you're probably going to see, with the new incoming Fed chief, you're probably going to see at least three raises this year, if not more. And I think they'll be significant. They're not going to be Janet Yellen raises. They're going to be real raises. So we're going to be in a, very, in a shifting economy. So if I, was, if I was planning on buying something, what would I buy today? I'd try and probably look for a primary residence. Uh, if I didn't have only 20% to put down, I'd probably look for something at 1.4, 1.3, something like that to, to maximize that eight, as much of that $800,000 as I could. But I'd get in the interest rate game right now, because that's going to change. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you were to choose an investment, would you uh, prefer uh, single family homes, assuming they are in the same price range, single family versus multi-unit versus a condo in a, in a complex? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take those in, in order, in uh, order of what I believe to be the, the least desirable, and that's the condo. Condo's least desirable because um, when markets shift, they always get hurt the worst. You have the least control over a condo and the least control of your finances because you also have an association that's controlling how much you have to spend every single month. And the desirability of uh, uh, resale is much less than a single family. So condo is the least desirable. Single family is the, in the middle. Single family is great. Always going to have a single family market. People love those. They always appreciate really well. But the multifamily will do better as an investment always. Why? It's because what we call the number of doors. So doors refers to how many tenants you have, right? So if you have a single family home over here, and you have a three unit building over here, and you have vacancy over here, you've got 100% vacancy. If you've got a vacancy over here, you have one third vacancy. So, and there's a, uh, there's a, it, it's just, uh, 
everything, your, your costs always get so much, uh, I'm, the word's escaping me here, there, there's a cost benefit, basically, to having multiple units, and you'll always, always do better. Investors look for as many doors as they can, so somebody who's really a big time investor in the multifamily, they want a huge complex. They want as many doors as they can because that's really where you make your money is, is the number of doors, the number of tenants you have. And that's the safest way to go as well. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes. I have a thought, so um, so uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on commercial versus uh, residential real estate and what basically if there's different strategies that you need to take with each and like what are the things we caution about? Sure, risk equals reward. And um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I own commercial properties, and we also own residential in income-producing properties. The, the commercial properties, a few years ago when the economy melted down, what happened? What happened? Real estate prices, the stock market failed, real estate prices plummeted, and businesses shuttered down, right? So there went your commercial real estate. What happened to multifamily? Bulletproof. Bulletproof. As a matter of fact, so many people lost their homes, there was such a big pool of renters, prices went up. When was the last time you heard rents are going down? It just doesn't happen. Residential, real, residential income producing real estate is, in my book I talk about it being resilient, re, uh, recession resilient. I wanted to put recession proof, but my, my uh, publisher said I couldn't do that, I get sued. But <laughs> recession resilient. I believe it's recession proof if you buy in the right area. When was the last time you heard rents are going down? It doesn't happen. But with commercial, it does. Commercial goes through that. Plus with commercial, like I own a couple warehouses and both of them I've split into two, two pieces. They were single, but I split them, I put two tenants in there just to mitigate in case one moves out. But I've had both of those dark at times. Now I get, I get a much better rate of return, a much better cap rate, if you will, off of my um, commercial properties. But I, I don't lose any sleep off my residential income properties, especially if I'm a good property manager. Anybody else? For, uh, for someone who wants to get into, uh, you know, or add, add real estate as part of their portfolio, but does not want to do anything with buying, management property, et cetera, is there an easy way where I can just give my cash to someone and get some of a return? Like, do you recommend, I mean, there's REITs, but peer-to-peer -peer stuff, like, do you have a recommendation for someone who- Yeah, give it to wants? me, I'll, I'll take care of it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's REITs, REITs are fine, but keep in mind, REITs, when you own REITs, you don't own real estate, you own stock. You know, that, that's different. So um, there are groups that, that, um, that, that, that do that. And um, I, again, it's kind of like the property management question. It's like, who are you giving your money to? You know, um, I, I've just seen too many people hurt on, on, on those. Personally, I think you gotta, you gotta if you're gonna be a real estate investor, and it's, it, there is, there's, a, a, there's work to it, and there's work the entire time you own it, I think you have to be hands-on, or probably don't, probably then just, buy a single family home, and that is your real estate nest egg. Uh, actually, my question was exactly, why not just buy, you know, like um, that, that fund in our 401k that, you know, does Exactly, those, those, those are, that's, that's stocks, that's REITs, but you know, you don't have all of the, um, you don't have as much control over that, and, and you don't have quite, you don't, you have a different set of write-offs. So you can certainly invest in real estate that way, but you know when you invest with a portfolio like that, somebody else is taking, somebody else is making those bigger choices for you. You're deciding when to when to buy and when to sell, right? But what is invested in is is different, and there's a cost to that because those people that run the REITs are getting paid. So there's a large amount of of what could be your profit that's going to them. So if you make those choices yourself, you're gaining all that profit yourself. It's just a different theory of investment. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, do you hi. have any tips for like market research uh, except looking at cap rates, like other things that you would look at? My, my tip is get a good real estate agent, seriously. I mean, that's, that's my best tip, is find somebody who's a professional in the area you wanna look at, and then and then. No, listen. I mean like research for areas. Oh, research for areas. Um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, and and that's, that's a fluid question, too, because areas are always gentrifying. Like right now, everybody's excited about Inglewood. You know, the, the stadium's going in there. What's, what's going to happen with Inglewood? And people are excited about Hawthorne, too. You know, is SpaceX going to buy the Toyota space and move in there? You know, so there's all these sort of fluid things going on. Um, 
right now in Southern California, we're in such a good market. I, I think that you're, 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 you're fine almost wherever you go. But look at anybody that bought real estate 15 years ago in Venice. My gosh, right? Just unbelievable. But you know, so you see something happening like Google moving into a neighborhood, put money there. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things like that. So you watch, you have to watch for the opportunities. And, and, and they'll, they'll, you just have to be cognizant of what's going on around you. Yeah. Anybody else? So uh, I have a question. So basically, if you have two options, one is a really nice house on a smaller piece of land mm -hmm. versus a crappy house on a large piece of land. So if you want to choose between the two, what is the trade-off between? Buy the crappy one. Always, always. I mean, that's where, you know, you, you always want to buy the worst house in the best neighborhood, you know? Location, location, location. Now, those are truly the th three rule rules of real estate. And if, you, if, you, if you're a handy guy and you can get in there and fix it yourself or you have the money, that's a great opportunity. Because that property, if somebody's selling it in, in, a, really, in, a, in a condition like that where it's falling apart, it's been priced accordingly, right? Or you're gonna pay for it accordingly. And then you create what you want it to be. You, know, you go in and you decide what floors you want and countertops and all that. And you make it your own, especially if you're gonna live there. And even if you're gonna rent it out, you do the same thing. But you always wanna buy, if you have the time and the energy and the willpower to go through all that. Because it's a lot, but it's like somebody else asked about property management. You know, that's real estate, you'll always be involved in maintaining that to some level, even if you have property managers. So if you're not scared of that, if you're not scared of taking that property and making it something better, that's the opportunity. Yes? So um, this might be an open-ended question on your advice for looking for tenants if I don't have a management firm. Oh. Like, um, do you, do you, like how long the contract is and what do, you, what do you look for in a tenant if you're doing it? First thing you do is run a credit report. And what I always do, um, I run a credit report and I tell my prospective tenant, here's a credit report, you pay for it. If your credit, if you have A plus credit, I'll rent the place to you and rent it back and, and pay for your credit report. But if your credit's bad and I give them a, a break point, then you're paying for the credit report and I'm not renting it to you. <laughs> and what happens then is most people who have bad credit don't even run the credit report. They just go away on their own. So it, once you get the credit report, that's really what you're looking at. Because people that have good credit, they got there by paying their bills. And that's really what you're looking for. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so if you were to be looking at an investment property, like let's say a fourplex, mm -hmm. and you're OK with it maybe it being like a long-term investment, like 10 years plus, you're going to kind of be more focused on the long-term appreciation and keeping hold of it, what would be a sort of minimum cap rate that you would recommend purchasing at? And sure. also, do you want something that perhaps needs a little bit of work? So as tenants move out, you can kind of come in and do a little bit of cosmetic fixing. Mm -hmm. Do you want something that you don't have to do anything to, not even like cosmetic, um, that has, it's totally, has no vacancies and has like a really low turnover? I have a lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, that's all right. That was like five I, I think questions. I got them all. Um, okay, so let's start with the cap rate because that's yeah. really important. Um, cap rates are area specific mm -hmm. and they're also property specific. So like we said earlier, your cap rate here in Venice, probably about two and a half, three, something like that. Cap rate down in Long Beach is about six and a half. So again, I would say, what is your motivation? Are you, are you buying for appreciation? Or are you buying for cash flow? If you say, I want both, then I'm gonna find an area with about 5% cap rate, right? So that, that's, that's the cap rate thing. There's no, there's no right, wrong, right cap rate or wrong cap rate. There's a right cap rate and a wrong cap rate for a specific area. And, that's, that's, and, and also for a specific property, too. Because even if you're in, um, you know, if you're in Long Beach, and you have one property that's, that has an ocean view and another one that's next to a smelting factory, they're looking exactly the same. They're going to have different cap rates because of different desirabilities. So those questions are always very specific. It's each, each property is so specific. But right now, in general, it, most of my investors are looking for a five cap. And that's, that's not that easy to find. And so that's sort of the hard, is, is finding that middle of the road property. And that's, that's where most, most investor dollars are going. 
Uh, your other question, remind was, me. Was do you want to buy something that maybe needs a little bit of light cosmetic work so that as yeah. a tenant moves out, you can do a little work and increase the rents or? Yeah, again, risk equals reward. If you don't mind doing that, you'll get you'll get a property that's uh, that probably um, will, will be on the market for a little bit less money. And when they move out, you know, as long as you have sort of that slush fund going, right, and you're willing to spend those dollars, because when they move out, you will need to spend those dollars. You will need to paint. You will need to carpet. You will need to bring it up to whatever the level is of that rental market. So you have to really keep those dollars on hand. And it's, it's healthy to keep, uh, you know, depending on what the property is, depending on the value of the property, it's healthy to keep pretty handy slush fund around. Because you never know. You, if you have a couple, all of a sudden, three or four people go dark at once you know, in a 10 unit building, that's a lot of money going away. So you have to be prepared. Not only do you have to keep your mortgage going, right? Your taxes, your insurance, all that. But now you've got to rehab all these units, right? Usually it doesn't happen like that. Usually people move out one at a time. Usually they're giving you notice. Usually it's a lot more smooth, but you never know. Yeah. Thank you.